2006, George Smoot shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for his studies of the cosmic microwave background. Smoot famously likened the results to seeing God, and Stephen Hawking was quoted at the time as saying it was the greatest discovery of the century, if not of all time. Five years later, I joined George in his office here at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to get his thoughts on the current state of cosmology and to find out whether winning the prize has changed his approach to science. Thank you for letting me come, George. Welcome, Physics World. <laughs> so um, this year's Nobel Prize has gone to one of your colleagues here at um, Berkeley, Saul Perlmutter. Did it go to the right people? Uh, I knew all three, and uh, I've known Saul for many years. He works just down the hall from here. It's a good floor to get a Nobel Prize. It, <laughs> we're, we're like the fourth set of people on this floor to <laughs> get Nobel Prizes. And uh, I think the discovery of the accelerating universe was a big surprise and a major discovery. And even though it's only five years since my prize, they got around to, to awarding this because it's so obviously an important discovery. And I think those were three good people to get the prize. So how about yourself since winning the prize? I mean, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, I'm doing a lot of things that I was doing before. So I'm, a, I'm one of the founders and members of the Planck satellite. We're taking data even as we speak. We're now taking the second year's worth of data and we're preparing a lot of papers, and so that's exciting. And I'm also working on how to build detectors for the next generation, but I've branched out and trying other things. So I have a big project that's taking me sort of around the world where we're trying to build a satellite, which we're scheduled to launch very soon and as a pathfinder, and then we want to follow up looking at gamma ray bursts, and which are the most energetic events that happen in the universe. And they come from the first generation of stars and condensed matter objects, they're potentially a probe of the high Z universe, but they're also interesting physics on their own. How do black holes form? How, what's the medium like? What happens? Mm. I mean, do, do you find you still have the same levels of motivation since winning the prize? It's funny, you have, you have a lot of distractions, a lot of other things that take you away, but on the other hand, you feel like you should try and encourage things along so that people can enjoy the benefits you did, because I came into a situation where there was a whole healthy science project going, you know, the whole field of science was very strong and healthy and it was moderately well funded and bright young people were encouraged and allowed to start projects and given seed, seed money and then encouraged to build up big projects. That's one of the things. But I also think it's also good to focus on big things that are gonna have major impact that requires some push and some, some guidance. So that's why I'm involved in some of these big programs. Mm -hmm. Do you, you find it's quite hard because obviously before winning the prize you could, you, you were free to speculate, whereas now people take whatever you say very, very seriously. So is it harder to actually function right. as a scientist? So the Nobel Prize is both an, uh, an asset and, uh, and a weight, but it also means you become a role model. So it's very funny, there are some people who sort of consider it consistently underestimate what I can do, and then there's a other set of people that overestimate. You have a Nobel Prize, you can do everything. And, and it's sort of, the, the truth is somewhere in between, but so sometimes the Nobel Prize helps you, sometimes it hinders you. It's, you know, it's just mm. like everything in life. I mean, looking at cosmology now and, and looking ahead, I mean, what areas of the field do you think could yield the next Nobel Prize discovery? Right, so there are several possible places. I mean, there's the issue of the dark matter, as well as the dark energy or the accelerating universe. But I, I think one of the areas that people kind of forgot about, even though it's important, is inflation. And we have both the people who make it, you know, prize for the theory, for predicting inflation, and for predicting there should be fluctuations from that. Plus, there could be the people who provide more evidence, more direct evidence that inflation happened. Mm -hmm. So there are at least four or five areas where I think it's possible for Nobel Prize winning discoveries. So it's a rich field, that's why it's such an exciting field these days. I mean, it's changing the subject slightly, looking at science in the US as a whole. I mean, I know when Obama came into power, he, he promised that it'd be a revolution within science. I mean, do you think he's delivered on those promises? Uh, I think he hasn't delivered on the process. I think he really would like to see science grow up. He sees that's a way to have innovation and job growth and the economy to grow. You know, there was a very strong push for clean energy and new, new kind of technologies and science there and for developing the basic sciences in the U.S. On the other hand, he's run into a situation where we have budget issues. Everyone in the develop, every developed country in the world has serious budget issues these days. And education and science 
are getting caught in that, but those are the, some of the key elements in how you're going to grow your economy and so forth. So the issue you have is you have to be careful about spending because you've been borrowing too much money and spending. On the other hand, you have to be sure that you make sure your growth and your innovation continue so you can be competitive in the world and that you can eventually pay down your debts. And so it's a trade-off, and m most people don't make that distinction. Right? So I understand you're involved in several development projects in Africa. Can you tell me about those? Right. So the, there's many areas in the world where we, where we try and you know, spread the word about science and technology and get people interested. So we run a teacher's academy. So I just finished uh, doing one in, in Paris. But Africa is kind of a pet project because sometimes I'm discouraged, sometimes not. And But it's a whole continent that's growing and has great potential to eventually take off and join the world economy. But it's critical for them to have the science and technology infrastructure. And so it's very important for us to encourage them. So I went with Neil Turok, Dave Gross, and Stephen Hawking and, and for a big opening of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, where people are brought from all over Africa and given high level training. Uh, they have to achieve, go to the university and get their first degree, and then they can come and get, get high level training. And then to work on very interesting problems, some that are directly relevant to sort of like how do you do currency trading if your economy is based on just one or two, you know, products, right? How do you plan your budget? You know, what about the spread of diseases, you know, like malaria and so forth? So we, you think mathematics turns out to be very important to, to building Africa, but it's a training center. Great, thank you. Thank you.